Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're very excited to have you joining us today in our session as part of our series on a culture of health. We're going to be talking about how income, work, and food all have an effect on people's health and health care. You're going to hear from some uh, authors about the research they've conducted in this area, and you're going to hear from some practitioners who are dealing with the reality of the constraints we have in our budgets and economy right now in a COVID-19 environment. You're also going to hear from my dog. Sorry about that. Um, to kick us off, I just want to uh, uh, turn over to uh, Mona Shaw, who is a senior program officer in the Research Evaluation and Learning Unit at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is dedicated to promoting a culture of health, and they are supporting this series and this event. I'll turn it over to you, Mona. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to the rest of the health affairs team for organizing this important conversation and for consistently providing us with a trusted and important vehicle for evidence and commentary on health policy and issues affecting health and health equity. As Alan mentioned, I'm Mona Shah. I'm a senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. At the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we are striving to build a culture of health, to advance health equity so that everyone in America has a fair and a just opportunity for health and health, health and well-being. Obstacles to health, such as racism, poverty, inability to obtain healthier food, and lack of access to jobs that offer sick leave can have dire consequences. To achieve our vision at RWJF, we are focusing on removing these obstacles by improving systems and conditions, by shifting mindsets, and by supporting policies and practices that promote health and well-being. As part of our focus on policy change, RWJF is supporting research, data, and evidence that in can increase awareness and promotion of health equity promoting policies. I'm excited to hear from these researchers on this panel on the importance of work, income, and food on achieving health equity, what we like to refer to as social determinants of health. This research will be tremendously important as communities look to reopen in light of COVID-19. For example, the research from Dr. Goodman highlights the importance of uh, implementation and raising awareness on paid leave. Dr. Corten's research shows how Paycheck Plus may be a promising policy for women of color who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and by racism. And finally, Dr. Kenny's new research about Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act could have implications to students who may need to access affordable healthy food options during the summer and potentially in the fall if schools are, remain virtual. So thank you to them and their incredible work and scholarship. And finally, behind the data are real people who are experiencing real struggles and wanna also thank them for their contribution and sharing their data to help produce this research. Thank you for joining us on this virtual panel and I'll turn it back to Alan. Thank you, Mona. And thank you to the Robert Johnson Foundation for your ongoing support of our work in this area. Let me just spend a moment uh, describing how we're going to proceed during this webinar. As noted, you'll hear first from three researchers who published in just the most recent issue of Health Affairs on the topics that Mona just discussed. I'll introduce them in a moment. They'll be followed by two practitioners who are dealing with the reality on the ground of budget constraints, COVID-19, meanwhile trying to pursue a culture of health Throughout all of this, you can use your uh, active conversation uh, interface to ask questions. We'll queue those up and we'll take them when we're done with all five of the speakers. But let me begin now by introducing the authors of three papers in our July issue. You're going to hear from Emily Corten, Assistant Professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. You'll hear from Julia Goodman, Assistant Professor at the Oregon Health and Science University and Portland State University and Erica Kenny, Assistant Professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. They'll each present the research that we published in the July issue. I'll turn it first to Emily. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you again for the invitation to present our work. I'm very pleased and excited to discuss our findings and their implications as part of such uh, an interesting uh, panel. 
so our study uh, looks at the effect of expanding one of America's largest anti-poverty policy, the earned income uh, tax credit. It's a paycheck plus demonstration, and we will present you the results from the New York City uh, site. Can I have the next slide, please? So the earned income tax credit is a refundable tax credit for low-income uh, workers designed to increase the wages of uh, of the working poor. And by all accounts, uh, the earned income tax credit has been widely uh, successful. In 2016, it was uh, estimated that it lifted out of poverty 6.5 million uh, people in the U.S., including 3.3 .3, uh, million uh, children. So the question we are asking here is whether this success um, in terms of poverty reduction can also translate into health gains. And to show you why we think that is potentially uh, the case, uh, I've uh, showed here um, a graph uh, which summarizes the mechanisms that might be at play when linking the earned income tax credit to health outcome. So the earned income tax credit is uh, impacting socioeconomic outcomes positively. It's increasing household income and employment rates, which in turn might reduce stress, uh, improve health behaviors, which ultimately can have a positive impact on health. And we actually have good quasi-experimental data along this pathway. What we didn't have is more definitive in a way uh, experimental evidence, uh, evidence from a randomized clinical trial, which is very much the gold standard when it comes to the evaluation of the effect of this type of, uh, of policy. So this is the first gap that uh, our study is, um, is filling. Can I have the next slide, please? The so second gap is very much a policy gap. So what you see here in this graph is a maximum earned income tax credit that you can earn depending on the number of children that you have and over time. And what you can see that is the line at the bottom of the, of the, of the graph, the dotted line, is the maximum earned income tax credit for low-income workers without dependent children. And as you can see, they earn really little, and this has not changed uh, over time. So Paycheck Plus is a unique expansion of, um, of design to really uh, overcome this gap that has been left by the traditional earned income tax credit. It was conceived by this observation that you see here, that low-income workers without dependent children are both realizing a net decline in real earnings and are also left out of most anti-poverty policies, including the earned income tax credit. Can I have the next slide, please? So what the earned income, um, paycheck, what the, the uh, paycheck plus experiment, sorry, is doing concretely is summarizing this graph. It shows you the credit amount that you can get depending on your annual earnings. And it compares the federal earned income tax credit 2016 at the bottom of the graph and the paycheck plus demonstration at the top of the graph. Paycheck Plus does two simple things. The first one is that it provides a much more generous maximum benefit to workers. It's the maximum benefit currently is about $500. Uh, With the Paycheck Plus demonstration, we quadruple that amount. It's up to $2,000. The second thing that it does is that it extends considerably the income threshold for eligibility. It's uh, about $15,000 in the current federal earned income tax credit. Beyond that, you're out. With uh, Paycheck Plus, it's extended, it's doubled up to $30,000. Uh, so as you can see, it's a very generous expansion of the system that you currently have. Can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, the uh, Paycheck Plus uh, experiment has been evaluated as a randomized uh, control trial. So if you can show the entirety of the, uh, of the slide, Thank you so much. So um, in uh, 2013, single adults were enrolled in New York City and were uh, randomly allocated either to the Paycheck Plus group, uh, which were, who was eligible to receive the Paycheck Plus um, demonstration, or to a control group. And we followed those two groups over time, and we assessed their socioeconomic and health outcome 32 months uh, late, later, so about two and a half years after randomization, after entry into the program. Can I have the next slide, please? And these are our key uh, findings in terms of socioeconomic outcomes. What we find is that um, the majority, but not all of the respondents who had earnings within the eligible range actually received bonuses for an average of $1,400 uh, per year. 
paycheck plus increase uh, after bonus income by 7% in the first year and 6% in the second year. And it increased employment by a modest 2% in the second year. And what is important is that those effects are much larger among uh, among women. In terms of health outcomes, we found no effect overall in our entire sample. But when we looked at uh, women eligible for Paycheck Plus, so in the treated group, they had higher gains in terms of health-related quality of life uh, than men, which makes sense because they benefited more uh, from the programs in terms of income and employment. So any differences that we are uh, noticing in terms of health are very small, um, but they are still not worthy, we think, because it's a very healthy and young uh, population. So our one main takeaway uh, to conclude from that uh, from that trial is that as we wait for more data uh, from other sites in Atlanta and results on biological uh, outcomes, these findings really offer some hope that restructuring a key social policy uh, in the U.S. might improve the health of low-income workers um, without dependent children, a population group who had suffered from income and health declines in the past uh, decades. Can I have the last slide, please? And I wanted to finish by thanking all my wonderful uh, co-authors. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emily. We'll move now to Julia. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about work um, that we did to evaluate San Francisco's paid parental leave ordinance, which was the first fully paid leave policy in the U.S. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues Holly Elster and Will Dow for this work. Um, I'm going to start by sharing some of the key findings from our study, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges with the policy that we think contributed to what we found, and finally provide some recommendations for making paid leave policies in general more effective. So I first wanna just spend a minute talking about why paid leave policies are important from a public health perspective. The beneficial effects of parental leave for both parents and children are well documented, but despite these benefits, access to paid leave remains limited and unevenly distributed in the US. Parents in the U.S. face incomplete job protection laws and a patchwork of state and local policies that provide partial wage replacement for only some workers. As a result of this, only about a third of workers in the highest wage decile have access to paid leave through their employers, um, and only about 6% of workers in the lowest wage decile do. Next slide, please. So in 2016, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors unanimously passed the San Francisco Paid Parental Leave Ordinance. The PPLO builds on the statewide paid family leave program, which already provided partial wage replacement for up to six weeks of caregiving leave. And the San Francisco law mandated that employers top up payments from the state during the six weeks so that covered employer employees receive full pay to care for a new child. This policy began being implemented in January of 2017 with the largest employers, and then it was phased in over the next year to ultimately cover all private sector employers with at least 20 employees. So we wanted to understand what was the impact of this policy. So one of the things that we found was a small but significant increase in the share of fathers who were taking leave after the policy went into effect. What I'm showing you here are from state administrative data on paid family leave claimants. So because workers need to have filed a paid family leave claim with a state in order to be eligible for PPLO benefits through their employer, these paid family leave claims should reflect any changes in response to the San Francisco policy. So when we compare to the surrounding Bay Area counties and to the rest of the state, men filing claims in San Francisco increased by about 13% in 2017 after the policy went into effect. Now, I'm not showing you the data for women, but we essentially saw no change in leave taking among women. Why is that? We wanted to understand why we didn't see anything going on with mothers. So we surveyed about 1,300 mothers in the years before and after the PPLO went into effect, and we asked about their knowledge of leave benefits. One of the things that really stuck out to us were huge differences in knowledge by income level. So lower income women were less likely to report that they understood the maternity leave benefits that were available to them or that their employer was helpful in making sure that they understood their benefits. 
We also saw big differences in the likelihood of reporting that the employer was a main source of information about paid leave benefits. And in fact, lower income women were most likely to report that they received no help from anyone about their benefits. Another part of the story seems to be about coverage. So while most women and their partners, regardless of income level, were employed around the time of birth, among those who were employed, lower income women and their partners were significantly less likely to work in jobs that were covered by the PPLO. That is, they were less likely to work for private sector firms with at least 20 employees and to meet the minimum job tenure and hours requirements. So what are the main barriers that we saw to parental leave taking? One issue is that eligibility is limited. The the biggest issue here is that small employers were exempt from the PPLO, and this leaves out a lot of workers. Another issue is that the enrollment rules are complicated, and in particular, the PPLO did not seamlessly integrate with existing state paid, um, paid family leave benefits. So there's this set of policies at the state and now at the city levels that are designed to support parents who want to take longer leave and to provide them with more wage replacement while they're out on leave. But these are administered by different agencies. They each require separate enrollment and they have different eligibility criteria. And this makes them really difficult for people to navigate. Um, Another issue is that employers found the PPLO confusing. We did a companion survey of San Francisco employers, and many reported difficulty understanding their legal requirements, difficulty administratively complying with the ordinance, and difficulty understanding their responsibilities regarding wage replacement. Uh, Another issue is that job protection is uneven in these policies. So the requirements for job protection do not always align with the requirements for paid leave. And this patchwork of rules creates confusion among parents, especially when we're talking about those who are experiencing pressure from employers to limit their leave taking. And finally, employers were just not a reliable source of information for many workers. Only half of Medicaid-covered women said that their employer was helpful in making sure that they understood their parental leave benefits. In the context of policies like this that are really complex and vary by employer and by employee, this leaves many parents without adequate knowledge to take advantage of these benefits. Next slide, please. So overall, our study suggests several recommendations for making paid leave policies more effective. First, we should make paid parental leave universally available. In addition to ensuring that the most vulnerable workers would then be covered, this also simplifies messaging. So working parents will be more likely to understand that paid leave is available and that their job is protected. And so they're able to take it when they need to. Second, we should figure out how to unify enrollment through a single government portal based upon one's place of residence. So if different regions have different benefits, then these should be reconciled between those relevant agencies rather than requiring parents to work across different agencies in order to get their benefits. Third, in cases where employers and employees both agree to this, we should make it possible for employers to file claims on behalf of their employees. So this would allow employers to provide paid leave benefits directly to their employees, and then they would seek reimbursement from the state, rather than having employees wait for their benefits to come through. And finally, family leave should be fully funded from a central tax-financed fund. The PPLO is really unique in that it requires employers to determine what wages are paid through the state paid family leave program and then to pay the remainder from their own funds. This process is really complex, especially for smaller businesses that don't have a dedicated human resources department. It also raises fairness concerns for employers that may hire a disproportionate share of new parent workers. So in our survey of San Francisco employers, we found overall that they were very supportive of the paid parental leave ordinance, but 43% reported that they would be more supportive if the policy were funded through a payroll tax rather than an employer mandate. And this kind of increased employer support and cooperation is really essential if we want to achieve the public health benefits that would go along with a simple universal leave system. Thank you. Thank you, Julia.
Uh, before I turn uh, to our third paper, I just want to remind viewers that uh, below the viewer box on your uh, webpage is, an op is a place where you can ask questions. We are taking those and collecting them as people speak, so don't be shy. The sooner you get them to us, the easier it is. If you're in full screen mode, that box won't be visible, so you'll have to jump out of full screen to find it and then jump back in. Uh, and now let's hear from uh, Erica Kenny. Erica? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today and good afternoon. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be presenting today on the work that my co-authors and I did about the impact of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act on obesity trends in U.S. children. Next slide, please. Um, the authorship team for this paper included Jessica Barrett, Sarah Bleich, Zach Ward, Angie Craddock, Steve Gortmaker, all at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And we were funded by uh, the JPB Foundation, the NIH, the CDC, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And as a disclaimer, the views that we express in the paper do not necessarily reflect the views of our funders. But we thank everyone for their participation, their funding. Next slide, please. To provide some context on why we studied the impact of this legisl legislation, school meals in this country are really critical for supporting healthy growth among U.S. youth. They're a very important part of the federal food safety net, um, and they really play a significant role in helping ensure that children have nutritionally adequate diets. So 30 million youth participate in the National School Lunch Program on a given day, and 14 million consume school breakfast. It's a very widespread program and a very widely used program. In particular, this program is really important for youth in poverty who are more likely to participate in school meals because they received free or reduced priced lunches and breakfasts and snacks. And importantly, youth in poverty are also those who are more at risk for obesity and have borne a disproportionate share of the burden of the childhood obesity epidemic in this country. They're also at high risk for other chronic health problems throughout the life course. So understanding if there's a way that we can help improve their diets early on and improve their risk of healthy weight and growing up at healthy weight is extremely important from a public health perspective. And the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 really took this issue on. Um, for all children, not just children in poverty, but just to completely redesign the standards for school meal programs. Um, so this act improved the quality of offerings um, by reducing sugary drinks and foods, reducing refined grains and promoting whole grains, reducing sodium, and then also setting sort of age appropriate calorie and portion size limits for meals. It also, for the first time, set standards for the, the foods and beverages that could be purchased at school through vending machines or school stores or on the a la carte line. So it had an impact potentially beyond just those who participate in the lunches and the breakfast. It could also impact what children were buying for snacks as well. Since the act was implemented, several studies have demonstrated substantial improvements in children's dietary quality, like improvements in the energy density and nutrient density of what they consume, reductions in total calorie intake, um, and also no changes really in food waste or participation, um, which was one of the concerns that people would stop eating the healthier meals because they only want junk food. And the research has really not borne this out. So a lot of the research on this so far has shown that this has been um, a pretty successful policy from a nutritional standpoint. Next slide, please. What hasn't been done um, is to really see whether the policy had sort of the intended impact on reducing the risk for obesity among U.S. children, which we know is very high. Um, the childhood obesity epidemic continues to be a serious public health issue in our country. And so we tried to estimate the impact of the law um, and the school meal policy changes in particular on population-wide trends in obesity among U.S. youth. And we also estimated whether those changes impacted youth in poverty differently from youth not in poverty um, because they have so much more to potentially gain from this policy change and because we are concerned about um, the health in particular of this very vulnerable group. Could you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So how we conducted the study, we leveraged um, publicly available data from the National Survey of Children's Health, which is a massive um, nationally representative study that's done periodically. Um, 
throughout the U.S. And we focused on 10 to 17-year-olds because they had data um, that their parents had reported on their heights and weights. And we did this across six survey periods, starting from 2003 all the way up to 2018, so that we could look at changes over time. We ended up with over 170,000 um, children that we were looking at. And we used an interrupted time series analysis approach, which sort of estimates whether there's a time trend across the population in obesity over a given period, and then whether a policy change changes that time trend. So we fit a logistic regression model that tested whether there was a time trend in the odds of having obesity before the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was implemented, and then whether that time trend changed afterwards. And we also estimated separate trends by child poverty status. Next slide, please. And what we found can pretty much be summed up in this slide here. So what you're looking at is the graph over time of the risk of obesity for children in poverty and children not in poverty. When we looked overall at the entire sample, we found really no difference um, before and after the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act went into effect. Um, it was pretty steady. But when we stratified by the child's poverty status, what we saw was that if you look at that blue line, that's children not in poverty, and it's pretty flat. There's really no time trend before or after um, that dotted line that goes down that shows when the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was implemented. But for children in poverty, which is the orange line, you can see that they were increasing in risk year upon year of having obesity. Um, and it was sort of steadily and sort of scarily increasing year after year up until this time point. After this law was implemented, which again Im impacts school meals for millions and millions of children in poverty, millions and millions of children uh, nationwide, um, and impacts potentially up to school two to three meals and snacks a day that are consumed at school. After this law goes into effect, we see that basically that trend is reversed. So the risk of obesity starts to decrease year after year and head back down to where it was at the beginning of the study. Meanwhile, what you can see with that dotted line that keeps sort of going up in the graph, that's what we project would have continued to happen with obesity risk had the law not gone into effect. And when we estimate how much higher the risk of obesity would have been if the law had not gone into effect, we estimate it's 47% higher than what we actually saw with the law in place. This translates to 500,000 fewer children in poverty that have obesity. So potentially very substantial public health gains. Next slide, please. So well, our implications of this are, are fairly simple. I mean, consistent with what many of our colleagues have found and the USDA has found, um, the changes to the school nutrition standards from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act were a public health success. They improved children's diets. They've been um, easily, not easily, but they've been widely implemented by schools. And they've been especially a success for the children who are the most vulnerable um, and at the highest risk for obesity, food insecurity, and poor nutrition. So we really have a chance here to help reduce inequities by socioeconomic status. The other implication we feel from these data and others' data is that these science-based nutrition standards should be maintained and protected against rollback efforts, which have been, of which there have been several over the last couple of years. So that's, that's the summary of our work, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. Well, as a policy journal, we're always interested in the relationship between this incredible research, very pow powerful findings, and what actually happens out in the real world. And we're uh, so happy to have uh, two speakers with us who are going to offer a perspective on what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Kim Campbell, Assistant County Administrator in Broward County, Florida. She has more than 25 years of experience in human services at the state and county level and in nonprofits. Uh, she and Broward County and as a whole were recipients of the 2019 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, National Culture of Health Award for making health a priority. You'll then hear from uh, Mark Nicole, president of the National Association of State Budget Officers, NASBO. He's the deputy secretary of the Maryland Department of Management and Budget, where he's worked for nearly 20 years in various roles, including as executive budget director. I'm going to turn it over first to Kim. 
Hey, everybody. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, so Kim Campbell, again, Assistant County Administrator down here in Broward, which is in South Florida. We're between Palm Beach County to the north and Miami-Dade County to the south. And um, we are a pretty diverse community of 2 million people. And, um, you know, our population is such that a third of, of our residents are, are white, a third are black, and a third are Hispanic, which actually means... Um, that about two thirds of our residents are considered potentially high risk for contracting COVID and for experiencing serious illness and complications as a result of underlying health conditions. Just in Broward County alone, we have 24,000 cases. So far yesterday, we had 1,100. Saturday was our highest day at 1,500. And I'm sure y'all, we make national news all the time for a variety of reasons, but you know, you can see, I'm sure you know, our numbers are really going up. So we're working very closely with our state department of health and our community providers to try to mitigate the social determinants of health that are impacting uh, a person's response to their experience with COVID-19. So um, I'll just real quickly um, run through some examples of the community initiatives and programs we have to try to bring our community back to wellness and stability. And we really believe that we were able to respond relatively quickly because we are um, known for um, creative collaborations and coming together very in a very responsive manner um, to deal with community needs. And um, our work around the recognition that racism really has a role to play in the social determinants and a trajectory of a person's outcomes over time. And so we're working intently to become an anti-racist community. So poised with those two frames in mind, we set about allocating resources to programs to mitigate the, the effects. So from a health perspective, we um, really looked at our HIV AIDS population, um, understanding that they're at high risk and we have the second highest new cases, new incidence of cases of HIV AIDS in, in the country. And a large uh, a percentage of those are, are uh, African-Americans. We immediately increased our outreach, our testing and our case management within that population of focus. We also have a very high uh, population of, of elders down here. People love to retire in South Florida, and it really is paradise unless you're in hurricane season. And um, so uh, in-home testing program for homebound elders, as well as disabled folks who can't come out to testing sites. Um, and that includes people that are residing in our group homes, our skilled nursing facilities, and our assisted living facilities as well. We um, have increased the number of pop-up, drive-up, and walk-up test sites. We realized in our community that is sometimes transportation burden that folks weren't able to get to our drive-up site locations. So we strategically placed walk-up sites, particularly in high poverty communities, so that anybody who wants to get a test can get one. They don't have to have a doctor's order or anything like that. Um, uh, sticking with the, the high poverty communities, we um, are designing an outreach and education campaign because even though we put those walk-up sites in those communities, we still had difficulty with people being willing to come get a test. And so we're strategizing with Hispanic Unity of Broward County, which is a large Hispanic provider, and Urban League, which is a large African-American provider, to do education and outreach about the disease and the social determinants of health relative to underlying health conditions and the necessity that folks get tested. Um, and we're going to offer in-home testing to, to people who um, agree so that we remove that barrier of them having to leave their homes to get a test. We don't have data on, on whether or not we're gonna be successful with increasing our numbers of testing in that population, but we're very hopeful um, because those two agencies really have long-term relationships with the residents that live in those communities. We have a robust contact tracing program in partnership with the Department of Health with hundreds of contact tracers doing that work. We have three proposals we're entertaining, two from, one from a hospital district, one from a university, and one from a private lab to do antibody testing to assess the prevalence of COVID in our community. And we're actually entertaining um, a proposal now on assessing samples of our wastewater to get a, a handle on our prevalence numbers in the community. So that's some interesting research that'll be coming out of Broward. 
Um, additionally, we've increased our mental health services through the telehealth methodology, since we know that folks aren't coming into offices and our, our mental health counselors and case managers feel somewhat uncomfortable going into folks' homes. So we've um, established a, a, a more robust telehealth community for those kinds of services, which are particularly important for the people who are isolated in, in this time. Um, I think something that's interesting for uh, a response mechanism relative to folks who are experiencing homelessness and are at risk of contracting COVID is our initiation of mobile sanitation stations that include showers and hand washing sinks and toilets. And those are on giant trailers. And we move those around the county where we know there's concentrations of folks that are living with um, um, in the community. Um, and we've instituted a non-congregate sheltering program where we're placing folks experiencing homelessness who have been exposed to COVID-19 into hotels and providing them with case management and meals delivery and medication delivery and those kinds of things, but also um, entering them right away into our coordinated assessment process, which, which gets them on the pathway to permanent housing. A lot of the folks that are homeless down here are chronic homeless, and, you know, it takes about eight times to get somebody to the point where they're ready to say yes, they're willing to do something about their homelessness. And so respecting the right to self-determination, you know, we provide the resources where they're at and getting them into that coordinated assessment process is really the first step in getting them on the trajectory to a permanent home, which we know impacts folks' health across their, their lifespan. Um, we've got four homeless assistance centers down here, and we've provided all of them with PPE and cleaning supplies and services in order to keep that robust and, 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 and as safe as possible because we know folks come and go throughout the day and we don't know where they're going and what they're being exposed to while they're out there. So it's important for us to keep that cleanliness and, and sanitation program up. Now, in the area of financial stability and employment assistance, we're doing a, a number of things, um, direct financial grants to small businesses to stay open and keep people employed, a massive feeding program that includes drive through service for the general public and a home delivery program for our elderly population. And that's in partnership with local restaurants. So we were able to open those back up. Some, some of our restaurants back up in partnership with our agencies that serve um, feeding programs like Feeding South Florida and our area-wide agency on aging so that restaurants could continue to operate and employ folks. So it was a creative way to, to, to meet the need in, in, in two, you know, kill two birds with one stone, I guess. Um, we're providing direct financial assistance to um, residents who need rent and mortgage assistance to prevent um, foreclosure and, and eviction, utilities, childcare, any sort of direct financial assistance we're, we're taking care of. But we're also partnering with legal aid to provide legal representation to people who are being wrongfully evicted during this moratorium. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that down here. Um, we have implemented a supported isolation program for low income households where space and family size don't necessarily allow for safe isolation. They might not be sick enough to have to have a hospital stay, but they need to be isolated from the rest of their family and they can't always. And so we're paying for hotel stays for those folks. We're delivering meals to the family's home of origin plus um, to the hotel. We're providing rent assistance, case management, and linkage to other support services. And I think what's what's nice about the supported isolation program and the in-home testing program for the, the um, high poverty communities is that for folks who do not have a relationship with a primary care physician, we're connecting them to our FQHC network and getting them established with a medical home and medical case management. So, you know, we're looking long term at, at the, the underlying health factors and, and, and risks and the, the long term effects of COVID that we think we might see and, and making sure that folks are connected to a health care system for the long haul. And then finally, we've got our work of workforce reentry and retraining program, and that's in partnership with local businesses and our um, Broward Community College. 
So we recognize that, you know, we're a service industry down here. We, we Hotels were shut down for a while. Restaurants were shut down for a while. People are really struggling. There are some places that will not come back online. And so we're entering into a partnership to retrain and reemploy folks. We've got success coaches. We've got job coaches and case management training and job placement. And so we're really excited about that because we, we really want people to um, stay in their homes, maintain their self-sufficiency, take care of their health, physical health and, and mental health, and, and get back on the road to stability in this very uncertain and chaotic time that we all find ourselves in. All of these things are done through the county as the lead agency and recipient of the direct allocation from the Department of Treasury. We got $340 million as our share of that money to serve the residents of Broward County. So our partnership is with the state and the various um, agencies that are responsible for serving folks, particularly the Department of Health, but also with our nonprofit community, our for-profit ambulance communities, our small businesses again. So we're really coming together as a collective to respond to the needs of the most vulnerable in our community. I'm, I'm very um, happy and proud of the work that we're doing. I know we have a long way to go and, and we're getting pretty tired like everybody else is, but I, I think we, you know, we have a good plan in place and, and we have the, the willingness and creativeness and flexibility to respond quickly to the needs of our community at the drop of a dime. So as things change over time, so will our funding priorities and, and we're all in it together and, and that's what it is in Broward. So so thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you, Kim, so much for uh, giving us the picture from Broward County. Now to, to look at matters from a state level, uh, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Sorry about that. I was I didn't unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, I want to start by really uh, saying how impressed I am with what Broward, Broward County is doing. Uh, I thought Kim's presentation was amazing, and I, it's very uh very impressed by that. Uh, today, I'd like to speak about how states are going to try to maintain critical health and social net safety services when faced with both a recession and a healthcare crisis. As you all know, the state has uh, the state and the nation has plunged into a recession uh, that is much worse. Uh, than the Great Recession. Just to give you a couple of statistics that apply here in Maryland, uh, we have reached uh, unemployment insurance claims in Maryland of half a million in just eight weeks uh, during the Great Recession that took 74 weeks. Our job losses during the entirety of the Great Recession were 123,000. Uh, we're expecting that in just this quarter alone, we're going to be uh, having job losses in the in the range of 240 to 350,000 uh, folks. Uh, these factors are obviously leading to significant losses in revenue to our state and to other states. Uh, in Maryland, our fiscal year 21 forecast is for revenues to be anywhere between 11 and 14 percent below uh, our prior estimates. And for the next year in which we uh, will be begin will begin preparing the budget will be anywhere between 13 and 20 percent lower. I would say generally on average, uh, Maryland uh, revenue estimates are probably a little bit better than uh, most of, of the other states. Some of my colleagues are facing challenges this year in the 15 to 20 percent range. So you can begin to see how those factors are, are causing some, some difficulties. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing these revenue losses. We're also experiencing uh, large increases in entitlement populations in Maryland, for instance. Our temporary cash assistance program, which uh, helps uh, some of our most needy, has gone from just uh, under 40,000 in uh, January of this year to 82,000 in June, uh, an increase of 110% uh, in just five months. And uh, this eclipses uh, the peak during the Great Recession of about 75,000 cases. At the same time, our, our uh, Medicaid caseload has begun to increase too. Right now, our caseload is about 4% higher um, than, than it was at the beginning of this calendar year. So we're fa facing some challenges in the healthcare arena too. Um, 
and 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 we're all doing and we're doing this at the same time we're in a healthcare crisis right so the federal government we feel as a state here in Maryland i think many of my colleagues in other states feel that the federal government has done a really a good job in helping us address the sort of financial and healthcare aspects of the pandemic uh, however, the assistance that we haven't received is really to help us deal with the economic and fiscal impacts of a recession. And so uh, what does that mean for state and local governments? It means that uh, we need to begin looking at how we get our budgets into balance. Uh, all 50 states, uh, except the one, Vermont, have a balanced budget amendment. So we have to get our revenues and expenditures into alignment. Uh, in fiscal year 20, I think, uh, you know, we face this challenge in a very short period of time, about three months. I think most states have been able to get through fiscal year 20 uh, with a sort of modest combination of budget cuts, uh, use of reserves and, um, uh, you know, and other sort of one-time actions so that, uh, the, the, you know, the pain may not, been, it may not have been as hard as it, it would have been otherwise. Uh, in fiscal year 21, which just started for Maryland uh, on July 1st and for many states, uh, the, the challenge is going to be much more serious uh, right now. Uh, in Maryland, we're trying to solve a uh, two, about a $2.3 billion budget gap. Uh, on the first day of the fiscal year, we uh, presented and enacted about $400 million of budget reductions across our state. Uh, and uh, those were in a variety of areas. We The plan that we had put forward really was a plan that uh, was uh, to try to bring the budget into balance in sort of thirds, uh, taking a, about a third of the actions right now, really early in the fiscal year, uh, taking a, th a third of the actions later in the fiscal year with uh, some legislation that will need to be introduced uh, with in front of our state legislature. And about a third of the, the uh, remainder of the solution would be from either future budget cuts, use of our state reserve fund, and or assistance from the federal government. Uh, that's a sort of very important piece of that. Um, there are a number of, of uh, other states uh, across the country that are taking more of a wait and see approach. Uh, there currently are uh, five states that have sort of what you would call maybe short term budgets that try to get them through sort of three months in anticipation of waiting to see if any additional federal assistance will be coming forward. Um, but one of the things that has become really clear uh, is the, the uh, critical need for public health and infrastructure and social safety net services. Uh, so in, in Maryland, when we move forward our budget cuts, I would say that uh, compared to uh, previous times when we've had recession, we really uh, paid a lot more attention to our health and social safety net programs. Uh, for instance, when I looked at, I uh, did an analysis of the reductions that we just proposed and enacted uh, compared to what was done during the Great Recession. Uh, in, in states, when we're looking to solve budget problems, we usually go where the money is. And uh, where's the money in state budgets? Uh, on average, about uh, 35 to 40 percent of state budgets are K through 12 education. And then about 25 percent of state budgets deal with health care. Uh, in Maryland, our, our ratios are pretty similar. And in, in the healthcare area, we're about uh, 28%. And in our Department of Human Services, our, our general funds, uh, we're about, to, uh, I think, about 6 or 7% there. So uh, in, in prior recessions, uh, significant portions of our budget actions uh, were in healthcare and in social safety programs. We pay particular attention, as I mentioned before, uh, not to do this. Uh, this time and and right now we have only of the 400 million we enacted about 14% uh, are in the health and social services area. Uh, we do still have lots of challenges going forward. Uh, we do have uh, limited flexibility with regards to how we are able to use our federal money to bring ourselves into recession. Uh, but one of the things that we have been able to do uh, with our federal funds is, is there are a number of, there are some, there is some ability to use uh, the federal dollars to deal with the direct impacts of of the pandemic. So we have tried to think broadly. Uh, we are making significant uh, investments in uh, funding for hunger assistance program, rental assistance. We know that our uh, 
school systems across the state of Maryland and frankly across the country are feeling some very real impacts of the pandemic. And there are a number of students who have uh, really felt that impact, have some very serious learning losses. We are dedicating a significant portion of, of monies to sort of deal with those crises. Uh, and uh, we have also just recently implemented a program to help our nonprofits. So we've uh, set up a fund, a nonprofit assistance fund of $50 million, where we'll try to uh, uh, help those providers who are helping the folks most in need in our state. Uh, what we really need from the federal government is for them to sort of be a partner in this with all of us at the state and local government level. Uh, I think we uh, aren't looking for a bailout. We do realize that this is a shared uh, struggle that we all face. Uh, and that even if we do get some federal assistance, that states will still be required to make some budget reductions uh, to get their budgets in balance and possibly also use their reserves. We just are hoping for some additional federal assistance to really prevent us from having to do more harm to the social uh, safety net and health services that, that many uh, uh, folks rely on. Uh, uh, the National Governors Association, which is led by my governor, Governor Hogan, right now, has made a request of the Congress for $500 million, $500 billion of additional assistance for state and local governments. We feel that this uh, will, uh, you know, will help us get through this situation. And uh, I, I guess I want to conclude by uh, giving you a, a quote that was sort of made by our uh, Deputy Secretary of Public Health in Maryland, who said, uh, what we are trying to do here is to prepare for the worst and we're hoping for the best. I think we are doing that both in terms of the pandemic and, and with regards to our state budget. Uh, that's all I have. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I've been collecting questions and would uh, remind people in the audience, I'll try to continue to review them as we go walk through some of them. And also just to let everyone know that uh, afterwards, this will be archived along with the PowerPoint presentations and will be made available through the Health Affairs website. So I'm going to go back uh, in order of the presentations just uh, with some questions that have come in. Uh, Emily, someone asked if uh, you collected data on how people used the income. Uh, I had actually broadened that question out because I know there has been research generally on how people use EITC uh, payments. I wondered if you could uh, take that question on. Thank you, and thank you very much for this uh, for this question. So, as part of the Paycheck Plus experiment specifically, we are not collecting data at the moment regarding how people are using the payment that we receive. But as you mentioned, there is very interesting qualitative evidence that is a great complement to the type of uh, quantitative evaluation that we are doing, showing how people are using those um, those uh, bonuses. So, the way the earned income tax credit is paid is as an annual bonus, and um, the evidence is clear that people are not using that bonus the way they would spend their income that on day on daily life um, items on food etc on the contrary they are using it as an investment to invest in more durable goods and um, I think that's a key question that's raised in the in, in the article is that it would be really interesting to understand how this has an impact on health that would be different from the usual impact of uh, incomes that we are seeing so we don't have a specific um, answer to 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 offer to, uh, to, to that question, but that's definitely something that uh, we would like to look into in, 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 in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Julia, um, you mentioned some of the characteristics that would potentially make the program more effective. Uh, simplicity, uh, dedicated funding stream, and as I hear those things, I think earned income tax credit, simple, uh, uh, administered through the tax code, as opposed to employer by employer. And I just wondered, since we just had a presentation on a supplement to the EITC, if you could reflect on any of the lessons from that work and how that might affect your thinking about uh, paid leave. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that there has been some work, especially looking at new parents around the impact of EITC um, and how that can potentially benefit Parents. I think this is something where 
I think we, we need to think creatively about what parents need and think about the diversity of what each individual family needs to, to make the situation work. So there are there have been some programs that I'm, this is making me think of um, where new parents are sort of either given some money to stay home and care for their kids themselves, or they can um, take some period or they can go back into the workplace and use that money to pay for another caregiver. And I think that's something that's sort of interesting to think about in that flexibility that for some parents, you know, for their own needs, they may prefer to be home and others may prefer at some point to go back into the workplace and have somebody else who can provide care and get money for that. Um, And I think it also really depends a lot on the kind of job that people have and the sort of pay that they're getting and and flexibility that they may have. So I think the EITC is a great, I mean, it's obviously a really important policy that supplements the sort of paid leave policy that could achieve some of the same goals. And and we should think about how they might work together or, or what we could learn about sort of just an income transfer program to achieve the same needs. Thank you. Uh, Erica, uh, we received a question. You alluded to the notion that there are efforts to roll back the standards on healthy food. Uh, The question was, if there's such a strong evidence base for their positive effects, uh, why are there such efforts? Uh, So that's a very good question. Um, I think that I mm, why are there such strong efforts to roll back the standards? I think that um, it may unfortunately, I think that you know providing healthy food to our children used to be a pretty non controversial idea, and it used to be something that had um, bipartisan support, and it has unfortunately been somewhat politicized in the last several years. Um, And I think that a lot of the calls for rolling back standards have not been based in science. Um, They have not been based on data that the USDA has collected themselves about how successfully schools have implemented the standards. Um, The the supposed uh, justification for the proposed rollbacks has been that, um, you know, kids aren't eating the meals, there's too much wasted food, um, people are having too much trouble um, implementing the standards. And that really doesn't match with what the evidence has been. Um, You know, school districts around the country have made really incredible efforts and worked so hard to make these wonderful changes. And they really should be commended for for making this kind of really difficult change for them and really having something that has had a a huge health impact on a lot of children. Um, I I think that unfortunately, um, you know, Michelle Obama was was very much linked with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act um, and she really championed it in its passage, um, although it had been a lot of the standards had been developed for years before um, the Obama administration and through um, bipartisan um, bipartisan groups. Um, but. I think the association with um, Mrs. Obama and with, um, you know, just the the Obama administration in general, I think has made it a target um, in the current political climate. Thank you. Um, Kim, uh, quite a few questions here. So let me uh, uh, just run through a few of them. Uh, One fairly narrow but important question. When you referred to homelessness, someone asked about whether this was – focused on adults or if it also included uh, homeless families? Families, both okay. families and, and, and adults, yeah. So I was struck, uh, that's, that's very helpful, and uh, I was struck as you began, you talked about uh, racism and anti-racism. The programs, other than the partnerships with some uh, specific organizations, seemed very focused on uh, a high risk status um, uh, diagnosis or something like that. So I wonder if you could help us all understand the anti-racism aspects of those initiatives. 
Well, well, we know that the legacy of racism is such that um, people of color have limited access or, or less access than others to care, and they have less access to transportation, and they have less access to um, employment opportunities that provide a living wage, and um, they have less access to healthy food. Um, and so, you know, when you have a food desert, you have all kinds of other deserts that are associated with that. And so, you know, looking at, at service provision and policy development from an anti-racist perspective means that you acknowledge that those conditions exist in the communities and that the people who live in those communities are not personally responsible for their conditions. And then you begin to strategize around how to mobilize resources in a way that respects their experience and helps lift the entire community. So that's what we try to do in Broward. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, a question about uh, the role of mental health, which is something people are often uh, pointing to as a source of unmet as a place of unmet need. Um, just wondered if you could go a little deeper in what the efforts are to uh, address uh, not just the mental health conditions themselves, but then the broader health implications of unmet mental health needs. Yeah, you, you know, we have a pretty robust system of care in Broward County relative to both children's mental health and adult mental health. So the county is a direct provider of the full continuum of substance abuse services for adults. And then we contract with a um, a wide variety, probably 65 providers of mental health services for adults and kids in this community. And so um, there were some agencies that had integrated primary care behavioral health models in place, and there were others that um, we were funding to provide telehealth services. But there were a large portion of them that were providing traditional home and community-based and some office-based mental health services. And we realized quickly that with people not being able to move about the cabin, if you will, that we were going to have to adapt um, those uh, contract agreements to enable the folks who didn't have access to provide those services the ability to do so. What's interesting is that the school district closed back in March and they moved to an online platform for the duration of the spring and there was a massive uh, movement to get all homes equipped with um, free internet from Comcast down here and laptops from the district. And so we were able, you know, to reach families that we might not have otherwise been able to reach through a telehealth modality because the equipment was provided for a completely different purpose. So that, you know, that, that was an, an interesting um, um, partnership um, that, that happened as a result of, of COVID. Um, you know, ev everybody knows what the research shows about mental illness and mental well-being and the effect of isolation on, on that and, and um, the subsequent um, impact on health. And I don't think that, that there's anyone living in the United States in this time that's going to be immune to that, either you're a direct healthcare worker or support worker, and you're working around the clock to make sure your neighbors and friends and, and, and communities are safe, or you're in government working in policy and, and programming, and, and you're working around the clock, or you're in the service industry and, 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 and working around the clock for those that weren't shut down and for those that are shut down and for folks who have lost their jobs. It's just a very, very stressful time. And so to ignore that um, all of us need some support and access to counseling and um, maybe even peer mentoring and, and case management services so that we stay connected to each other in this time is really critical. Um, what we don't want to see is an increase in suicidality and self-harming behaviors as a result of, of this pandemic and and. You know, as, as Mark said, with the recession on top of that, it's just a devastating time for these communities, ourselves included. And so we have to take care of each other. Uh, thank you. I have more questions, but Mark, I want to bring you in as well. Um, so you mentioned the, uh, the natural tendency when times are tough fiscally to go to where the money is, K-12, a third of the budget you called it healthcare, but it's mostly Medicaid is the, the other big slice here. Uh, our first presentations here were about employment and income and food. Where do those kinds of programs fit as you're 
looking at a state budget in terms of uh, priority, in terms of the scale. Uh, when you have a, a hole this big, I'm sure you have to look everywhere, but I just wonder if you could reflect on unemployment, income, and, and food as, as state-level issues. Sure. So obviously, as we are uh, trying to deal with the uh, challenges of unemployment um, and income, clearly, uh, I, I would I would just say generally, uh, then when states are trying to uh, uh, address budget gaps, uh, where we are trying to make sure that uh, the resources in those areas are really sort of not not uh, they're held harmless uh, because you know part of moving out of recession is to be able to make sure there are employment opportunities available to everyone uh, and, and and one of the one of the things that uh, you know obviously happens as you do have increases in in um, um, you know, case loads in, in Medicaid and temporary cash assistance. Uh, additional federal resources are being funneled those in, in those directions. I think we've uh, been able to sort of use our, our coronavirus relief funds to sort of supplement uh, some of the assistance for folks in those areas. Uh, but we are, you know, certainly very focused on trying to uh, make sure that there are opportunities for uh, folks who have felt uh, uh, unemployment uh, and the effects of the pandemic to have have some ability to sort of get back on 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 firm footing um, you know as we move forward uh, that's 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 very helpful um, you also uh, someone asked you, you you mentioned toward the end of your remarks about a uh, some support for nonprofit organizations and that also seems like a potentially ripe space for uh, organizations that are providing some of these services. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about who's participating in that, what it, what that approach looks like? Right, sure. So uh, this was something that uh, Governor Hogan just announced uh, about a week ago. Um, I think what we had been hearing uh, in the last uh, two to three uh, months is a lot of concern from uh, providers of services that that uh, many Marylanders use about the the sort of uh, the sort of the financial difficulties a lot of these organizations were facing, uh, and we had been receiving these from our behavioral health community, from our arts organization, from housing agencies about just uh, you know we need some support. Uh, and uh, I think we, as a state, had received uh, uh, so much of that uh, that, you know, and, and clearly these are folks that are providing very important services that, uh, you know, the governor um, sort of tasked us with, uh, you know, developing, uh, you know, a program to sort of help that. So it'll be essentially, a, you know, sort of a, a business assistance type of program, but, you know, we will, um, we are going to certainly target certain areas, uh, but it'll be, you know, anything from, you know, sort of payroll supports to uh, helping folks that, you know, might need assistance in getting personal protective equipment uh, if, if, you know, that that is something that they need or some costs that they're incurring. I, I just think we saw, we saw a great need there and we wanted to respond. So for both Mark and Kim, uh, there are some numbers in your presentations and I'm just trying to, they're big and I'm trying to help uh, understand them. You've got a two and a half billion dollar gap in the Maryland budget. You've taken 400 million out already. Um, Kim, you mentioned 340 million dollars in in fed federal supports. Uh, I just wonder if both of you could give us some sense of scale here, not just you know the total numbers of your budgets, but um, uh, at the outset, Mark, you put. The, the, the rate of decline in jobs and, and the like in, in some historical context. Help us understand the scale of the problem here. And Kim, I'm particularly interested in whether the 340 million is a good number from your perspective or if it needs to really just be the first uh, payment. And if so, uh, when, when you'll need more. Uh, it's an easy question to ask, a harder one, I'm sure, to answer. Mark, you want to just give us a little more perspective on those numbers? 
Sure. So uh, we have a budget that uh, the General Assembly enacted for fiscal year 21 that was about $19.6 billion. Uh, this is a sort of ahead of all the sort of the revenue losses. So we have actually looked at, so we've done a sort of variety of forecasts. And one of those forecasts for fiscal year 22 would put our revenue at about $16 billion, which is right between the amount of revenue we collected in fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16. So six years ago. So we, we've in, in, in presenting our uh, reductions to our Board of Public Works last week uh, had a had a kind of a very stark chart that basically said six, year, six years of economic growth just vanished, right? Uh, that's, that's the kind of revenues loss we're looking at. Uh, if you go back to the sort of revenue loss numbers I was talking about, 11 to 14% in the current year, uh, going back to the Great Recession, the largest uh, revenue revision that we had uh, at that time was a, about six and a half billion dollars, uh, no, six, uh, 600 six and a half percent. So, you know, just a little less, a little more than half of what we're looking at now. So it, the, the, the impact is, is much starker and it frankly happened so much quicker than in the Great Recession. It, it really is, that's the reason it's such a challenge. Thank you. Kim? Yeah, so um, I have a saying, I've been saying it for probably two decades, and that is we will never have enough money to meet 100% of the needs 100% of the time. And um, $340 million sounds like a lot of money. Um, I will say that Broward County is a very difficult place to live in if you're not wealthy. 65% of our residents are housing um, burdened. They spend upwards of 40 and sometimes 50% of their incomes on just their household expenses to keep a roof over their head. It's a, it's a, a large service industry and, and that's the result of that. The, the cost of living here, even though we don't have state income tax, is really, really high because there's a huge gap between what we pay down here for rate wages and what landlords charge for rent. We know that the majority of people who are going to need our help to maintain their housing have not come to us yet because of the moratorium. And we also know that when that moratorium is lifted, that landlords are going to want their rent and they're going to want all of it. The, the past due isn't going to be waived or forgiven. And so given what we know about our, our, our population that we call Alice, our asset limited income constrained families, um, we're going to get a, a massive influx and we're going to burn through that money pretty quickly. Um, so we're, we're concerned about that. And um, so, so the short answer to your question about whether or not we could use more money, um, yes. And when do we need, need it? Cut the check. <laughs> Meet you know, need it now. And and what would also be very helpful, um, don't know if there's any government officials on the line from the federal level, but this deadline to spend these dollars, uh, December 31st, 2020, is an arbitrary date that isn't that isn't practical from an on the ground administrative perspective. Families aren't going to be recovered December 31st, 2020. And um, not only do we need more resources, but we need more time to allocate those resources to our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna close with me uh, turning to each of you sequentially, and I'd like you to reflect on this question. Uh, for our paper authors, the question is, you have two quite influential government of officials on the panel and others listening. Uh, beyond just the direct findings from your study, which I think you've already presented very clearly, what message would you give a policymaker about the relationship between the topic that you study and health? And Kim and Mark, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot and ask you to wrap up with what new reflections perhaps you have based on the research that was presented today about as you are going forward with your uh, policy and budgetary decisions, um, how new information about income work and food might affect your thinking as you're also uh, trying to promote the health of the people in your states. 
And I think I'll just go uh, through the normal, through the order we started in. So uh, Emily, do you want to start us here? Yeah, thank you. So I think very briefly, I would say that um, I can only understand as a policymakers how huge those uh, investment in social policies are, uh, those huge upfront uh, investment in social policy. But what we know from all the evidence we look at is that they do pay off. Uh, all those investments in uh, early life education, in income, in employment, uh, in families, there is very strong evidence, especially in the US, that they're actually very clearly cost effective. So um, I think taking, trying to take, even in very difficult circumstances like the ones we are living through right now, a long-term perspective, um, I think, is really key because there will be uh, returns on those investments in terms of the income, employment, and, of course, because this is my, my topic in terms of the health of those population, that will make those policies uh, definitely cost-effective. Wonderful. Thank you. Achua. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. I think that in terms of the employment and workplace supports for families right now, a couple of things that stick out to me as being really relevant are thinking about how to broaden these types of policies so that they're available to more workers. I mean, clearly the COVID-19 crisis right now has um, sort of reminded us about how important workplace supports are and how important the workplace is in terms of its impact on health. And that if workers don't have the support to step away from the workplace when they need to, when they're sick, when they need to provide care, a lot of workers are going to end up completely leaving the workforce, right? Having to, to quit their jobs um, or risk getting fired. And so thinking about, you know, broadly, certainly beyond parental leave, thinking about all kinds of um, caregiving, sick leave that needs to be expanded, um, how important that can be, not only for the health impacts of those workers and the community that they are potentially, you know, exposing um, if they are sick, but also thinking about their financial security. There's been so much work coming out lately around particularly women leaving the workforce because they don't have the kinds of supports that they need. I think thinking about what um, government agencies can do, really thinking about how to simplify these policies and when there are innovative counties um, like Kim's County in Florida and doing all these really great things to support their population. One of the challenges that we've seen in, in this area of policy is that those policies then don't necessarily align with the state policies and any federal policies that may exist. And so thinking about how to, to reconcile these policies and support the individuals on the ground who are navigating all of these different systems. Thank you. Uh, Erica? Thanks for that question. I think I would echo um, what Emily was saying as well in terms about the importance of early intervention and how it seems like a big investment to start with, but it's really something that can really pay off in the long run. Um, so better nutrition policies for children and feeding children healthy food and making sure that we continue to invest in that is really so important for the long-term health of our population and our long-term healthcare costs. Um, preventing obesity and preventing diet-related chronic diseases is, is just so important because we know that once, um, once folks sort of gain extra weight or start those processes of developing chronic disease, it's very hard to reverse. And so, so finding a policy like this that can help actually stop this early and, and really help improve kids' health early on is a really critical investment. Um, I think another thing to, to keep in mind during the time of COVID and as we've seen these massive impacts on our economy is that so many more children are going to be food insecure. There are already many more children and families that are food insecure and really need these programs and also need to maintain their health and maintain their nutritional adequacy of what they eat so that they can maintain their health so that they are not at lower risk for COVID as well. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot riding on this program. And I think as much as, as much as it may seem like a huge cost or a big um, shift to try to keep it implemented, it's really a critical thing to keep going. Great. Thank you. Kim, any reflections on what you heard today? 
Um, so I, I would say I agree with Julia's um, statement about this need for um, synergy or consistency or coordination among the, the levels of, of government and policymakers being on the same page about um, what we're trying to do on behalf of our constituents and communities. There are definitely silos and disconnects that exist and the extent to which we as as governmental officials and 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 our elected officials who set policy to get on the same page using the research that comes out of the the professional pool um, as our as our guidepost is really where we should be um, it, it's most helpful for me to um, look at the latest research and see a section in your papers that um, speaks to the policy implications, not just the implications for further research or the recommendations for further research, but the actual practical policy implications that we can take and run with. Um, that would be most helpful from, from a policymaker's perspective. Um, and then finally, I would say that it's interesting, um, Erica's um, presentation about uh, school lunches and that because um, she's right, particularly in this environment, people are food insecure and, and we have feeding programs from a bunch of different angles all over the place. And one that we did not anticipate in Broward was that with schools closed, we continue to feed children and their parents were bringing them and they needed to eat too. They didn't have food at home and the district couldn't get reimbursed for feeding the parents. And so it just, it, you know, it just speaks to that disconnect from a policy perspective about what's allowable and not, particularly during a pandemic. And this need to have districts provide healthy, nutritious meals, particularly if we're going to continue feeding whole families um, for the long term. So very interesting conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm very um, honored to have participated in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And Mark? Great. Uh, but thank you, Alan. Uh, I, I think what I would say here is, you know, a, a form like this is great. Uh, a sort of communication research is, is very important. I, I would think I, I'll, I'll sort of echo a little bit of what Kim said, you know, very sort of uh, concrete research based kind of proposals that come up with, uh, you know, um, Con very concise, you know, recommendations and 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 uh, uh, policy implications for uh, proposed programs. I think all three of the research papers that were presented today, in, in you know, seven to eight minutes, right? They kind of just got you focused on exactly those topics. Talk to you about sort of how we did this you know, why it's important and some of the very important and concrete and sort of longer term uh, implications of these things. Uh, I, so I think, you know, uh, that that type of research is, 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 is outstanding and it's just the kind of thing that uh, policymakers need to see, uh, they, but it needs to be communicated in a very sort of, uh, sort of concise manner. So that sort of coordination and research and communication, uh, just, just kind of like I mentioned, uh, when we started hearing from all these nonprofit uh, providers who were talking about, hey, we need help, you know, we heard that. Uh, I think, you know, we need sort of folks to sort of be communicating uh, with, with with us on these on these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, I just sort of throw out sort of one extra sort of lesson learned here uh, from from the from this recession is and sort of throw it back to sort of where we were before. Uh, I, I would say probably as a whole, most states have uh, underinvested in uh, local public health services. Uh, for the communities we serve and and we support, uh, and I think the uh, you know this this sort of certainly this pandemic uh, really um, tells us about how we need that that how important that infrastructure was and why we need to make sure that we keep it supported. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank our audience for submitting some terrific questions so that we could have a nice conversation. I want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting our work in the culture of health and this briefing. And most of all, I want to thank our authors and our policy leaders for really engaging uh, high quality presentations, very thoughtful, very relevant, 
and encouraging in a tough, tough time. There are some great ideas out there, some great activities going on addressing very challenging problems. And it's heartening just as a, as a citizen of this country to know that there are people working as hard as you are to, to do the best you can in, under very difficult circumstances. So with that, uh, with thanks to all, uh, we are adjourned.